Well, take your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. While you're standing there, we'll read a couple verses, and then we'll have a word of prayer and jump back in. The book of Ephesians chapter 1, we are through the introduction and uh, moving into some of the theme of the book. And so hopefully we can make a little ground tonight. I apologize for my voice in advance, and uh, I'll do the best to try to make sure that it all comes out with the right notes and the right tones tonight. We'll see how that goes. But Ephesians chapter 1, let's go to verse number 3, and uh, we'll start reading there. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not sure how the pulpit turned into a fly trap, but there are multiples here. <clears throat> I don't think you're supposed to say that if it's on live stream. So anyways, there we go. All right, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will." to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be able to be in your house tonight, and I pray that you'll help us as we study your word. Lord, may we be reminded not just of the doctrine that's here, but also the practical applications as well. And I pray they'd be a help to us, that you would grow us and teach us with every other ministry that's meeting tonight as well. Would you honor the word of God as it is read and shared and taught? And I pray that uh, your name would be lifted up all over this property in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. We just began Roman numeral 2 last week. I think Roman numeral 1, we laid a little bit of a foundation and the first couple notes there in verse 1 and verse number 2. And now in Roman numeral 2, uh, we pick up with these the main portion of the outline. I think it's kind of bled over onto itself, but we're down uh, a little bit into the outline. I think we're a little further than that. But Roman numeral 2 is the Christian and his behavior the believer's possession, and we're all the way down into small letter A and Roman number one in, or number one in parentheses, and we'll get there in just a moment. And uh, we, if you've been taking notes or following along, this is the pinnacle of the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> it tells us what we possess in Christ. I mentioned to you last week that the theme of Ephesians is that phrase, in Christ. It's all through the book in some form or fashion. It's in every one of the chapters in some form or fashion. And the reality is that we have a treasure in what we possess as a Christian. And so as, and we've taken a little bit of time on purpose in the foundation because if you don't lay that foundation, then really chapter two through six, you don't have as much emphasis because you must have that uh, that uh, foundation laid there. And so we are made rich because of what we have in Christ. Now, if you remember, I told you last week that when you start in verse 3 and you go all the way down through verse number 14, that's the longest sentence in the Bible. And it just goes from verse to verse and verse, and, and uh, there's punctuation, there's commas, but it's all in a sentence that works together and flows together, and it's carefully orchestrated. So letter A, small letter A, is the will of the Father, and then number one is the source. Beginning in verse number three, it all starts with this master designer, and we got these first couple notes here last week. There's a definite plan by the will of the Father, God has always had a plan. God did not in heaven say, whoops, man sinned. What am I going to do now? He's always had a plan. Uh, God was not surprised that he would need to make provision for mankind. And, and that's what, this, uh, what this, this portion of Scripture is. When you talk about these doctrines, Jesus Christ came to make it possible for us to know God as the Father. And Paul wants these uh, Ephesian believers to recognize this is the wealth that they have because they are in Christ. Number two is the scope. <coughs> and this is where we left off. And you get into these verses that sometimes are twisted or taken out of context and uh, some of the doctrines will be uh, skewed by different religions and different teachers but the Bible says that he hath chosen us in him 
And then you get to verse number 5, and he uses that term predestinated and adoption. What does all that mean? And I would highly encourage you that if you're not in the service last week, go back and listen to the sermon from last Wednesday night to get the context of those doctrines. Is the doctrine of predestination and adoption and election in the Bible? Yes. But that does not mean that the way that all or many folks teach it is accurate. God does not choose some to go to heaven and choose some to go to hell. He does not. And so there are many that want to twist that and turn that. And I'm glad that God has had a plan long before me and you. He has had a plan before the foundation of the world that he would make it possible for mankind to be reconciled to him. That's salvation. And Paul is going to tell the Ephesian believers all about that in chapter 2 here in just a moment. Verse number 5, he tells them about this special purpose. What is that purpose? Verse number 3, that they would get all the blessings that God has. That's the purpose. That's God's plan. That's what he wants to do. And then, as he mentions about the adoption, there is a standing that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation is settled. Once we've trusted Christ, it is settled. It is certain. I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to lose that. I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to get part or all. I've, I've received all that Christ has for me when I've trusted him as my Savior. Now, there's blessings that he wants to give me. But salvation's complete. I don't have to work to do anything else. I don't have to finish it. He's already finished that work. And that is necessary going into the rest of this chapter. Now, number three in our outline picks up in verse number six with the significance. So the source, the scope, <coughs> and then the significance, <coughs> if you've been following along or if you're taking notes, notice the verse, to the praise of his, uh, of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse number six is considered the first stanza of a hymn of praise. All right, now look at the verses for a moment, and let's just, let's just kind of pick out some things. So first of all, in verse number six, it has this phrase, uh, the praise of his glory, or excuse me, the praise of, his, of the glory of his grace. Then if you drop down to verse number 12, you read this phrase, the praise of his glory. Then if you drop down to verse number 14, you read this phrase, the praise of his glory. There's a theme that he's repeating, verse 6, verse 12, verse 14. They all have a connection in whom? In Christ, in him. It's all laid in that same, uh, in that same doctrine, and again, it's in the same sentence of reinforcing this is what you have in Christ. So what's the significance of being chosen and the adoption? What's the significance of what that means for me? Well, the significance is I've been accepted. I've been accepted. Notice the verse, verse number six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Without God's mercy and his grace and his cleansing and his atonement and his forgiveness and the list goes on, we could not enjoy eternal life. We could not have the hope that we were on our way to heaven. We couldn't be a part of the family of God. But the Bible tells us that we have been accepted because of Christ's work on the cross. I'm accepted. Do you know that acceptance is one of man's great psychological needs? That's a part of how God created us. He has created within you <clears throat> a desire to be accepted. That is, that is part of his master design. In fact, one of the reasons why we're seeing a kind of a shift in the generation of young people that have grown up with social media as a diet, it's because they have built a lifestyle based on acceptance and on likes and on emojis. And if they don't have those, they don't feel accepted. That's the generation that is right behind you and I. And so uh, I wonder if, if a, a young person thinks, well, all of a sudden black hair and black nails and black makeup and dark uh, makeup, that, that gets me accepted. Well, I want to be accepted. If a certain music choice equals acceptance, well, I want to be accepted. 
If, if gender neutrality or if sexual um, orientation gets me acceptance, well, I want to be accepted. And there's a lot of confusion with this, especially this whole sexual orientation thing of young people who, first of all, are too young to even know any different, but they feel an acceptance. It's given to them by their peers. It's given to them sometimes by authority. And acceptance is put into us by God. I wonder if we could change the drift in society if young people found acceptance at home. Or if young people found acceptance in the church house. By the way, when was the last time you gravitated over to a section that had only young people in it? And spoke to them. And let them know that they were welcome and accepted in this place by you. Acceptance by other people. That's how God made us. But ladies and gentlemen, that's nothing compared to acceptance by God. And Paul said, <coughs> we have been accepted. Well, what does, what does that mean? The word accepted here means to surround with favor or to stay with the theme of verse 3, to honor with blessings. I've been, I've been given a place of honor, and, and I'm now going to be showered with blessings during World War II. It said that women in the country of Wales tried by the droves to immigrate to the United States of America because they thought that life was easy in America and life was affluent because that's what they saw in, from Hollywood films. So, so these ladies from the country of Wales and, and Britain and other places, they tried to get into America. They were denied passports. They were denied passage. Imagine that. There was a time in our country when, as an immigrant, you had to have immigration papers. They were denied all of that. And so, by the droves, by the hundreds, they stowed away on ships headed for New York City. When they arrived at the bay, many of them were found and were exposed, and they were put right back on a ship and sent right back where they came from. Still a good policy. Well, not long after that, Germany declared war on the United States after Pearl Harbor. And if you're a historian, you know that thousands of American soldiers arrived in Great Britain, and they were there to fight. What happened was, <coughs> British women by the droves began marry, uh, marrying American soldiers. They were called GI brides. You remember that? I mean, it was the thing. Find you an American soldier and get hitched. And so they did. And, and it was so much so that the only time in the history of America, the United States sent ships back to Britain to get these brides and bring them to America. It was interesting that when they came, many of the ladies gave testimony that they tried to come the first time and they were sent back to their country because they were stowed away and they tried to immigrate the wrong way and they were rejected. But now this time, they were warmly greeted. When they got off the ships, there was bands and there was red carpet and there were crowds that were cheering them. They were being welcomed into America. And the government in that time looked at their husband and the citizenship of their husband and the service of their husband and who their husband was and accepted them into the nation. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, in the same manner, you can't get to heaven on your own merit. You're not going to get there by your own stowaway. You're not going to somehow arrive and sneak in unbeknownst. But because of Christ and because of who He is and our faith in Him, we are accepted by God. He is the husband. The church is the bride. Welcome home. That's the emphasis of this word here that Paul uses. We are accepted. His blood has covered our sins. What a treasure. But now notice, notice, notice the verse. To the praise of the glory of His grace. The word grace is going to come back up in verse number 7, so we'll get that in a moment. Wherein He hath made us accepted in who? The beloved. Okay. Not, I'm not accepted because of my prayers. I'm not accepted because I'm a member of a church. 
I'm not accepted because I went through the baptistry waters. I'm not accepted because I fell out in the aisle and I spoke in some sort of slain tongue. And I'm not accepted because of any of those things. I am accepted in the beloved. So then the question becomes, who's the beloved? Well, the first time that phrase was ever used of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was spoken by God the Father. Mark chapter 1, verse 11, when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, the Bible says there was a voice from heaven that spoke and said, This is my beloved Son. He is the altogether lovely one. He is the chief among 10,000. He always did the will of his Father. And Jesus gave himself to us at Calvary. But he gave himself for us in salvation. And we have been accepted if we have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the moment you get saved, the transaction is complete. There is no place later in chapter 2 that says if you finish this, you'll be accepted. There's no place in chapter 3 that says once this happens, you'll be accepted. My friend, based on Christ and the finished work of Calvary, I am accepted when I by faith trust in Him. The Bible says, for He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I'm accepted. God looks at us through the Beloved. When God looks at me, I'm glad he doesn't see all the sins and the wrongs and the wickedness of who I am in my flesh, but he sees me through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you know that angels don't even have that? Only you as a saved individual can claim that accepted by or in the beloved to the praise of his grace. Grace was God's idea. It wasn't man's idea. It wasn't your idea. It was God's idea. It was God's plan from the beginning of time to choose. It was God's plan to predestine that you would receive all of those blessings. It was God's plan in His grace that He would provide a way to save mankind from their sins. There's not enough time in a service or in a day to sing all of the praise because of what you have. His matchless love and grace. It was all by the will of the Father. So letter A is the will of the Father. Small letter B now is the work of the Son. Now there's a little bit of a shift. <clears throat> We're in the same sentence, but there's a little bit of a shift in the emphasis. Verse 3, 4, 5, and 6 all have to do with God's plan. But now we begin to look at specifically what did Jesus do for the world? So number one, verse seven, it begins with redemption. Look at verse number seven. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Well, if you've been in church for a length of time, you've probably heard preaching on verse seven. I mean, there's a mouthful right there in that verse. There's a three-point outline separated by commas. It's pretty clear. Go ahead, write your own outline. Say you came up with it. It'll be wonderful. But it's laid out for us very clearly. And there's several things that are happening in this verse that kind of put into a practical perspective what Jesus did at Calvary. There's a story of a little boy who lived by the sea. And one of the things that he really enjoyed doing was carving little boats from pieces of driftwood. So as he got older, he got a little better at it, and he would go down to the seashore, and he would find pieces of wood that looked like they had some character and some carvability, and he would take them back, and he would work on them, and he would carve them. And one day he found the perfect block of wood, and man, it was just the right size. It was the right density. And he said to himself, I'm going to make this boat the best I've ever created. So he took that piece of wood home and <clears throat> he carved and he detailed and he sanded and he painted and he lacquered it and finished it. And the fin uh, finally the time came for him to show off the masterpiece to his family and to his friends. And, and then he waded out into the water and he let the little boat go and there it sailed. And it would bob up and down and bob up and down. And, uh, and then a, a big wave came and crashed over the top of that little sailboat and, and it disappeared for a moment. And what happened was that undercurrent that took it, it, the boat had slipped out even further, and there it appeared, and it popped up this time on the backside of the wave. 
But now, instead of the little boat bobbing just right there at the shore, it would every time the wave would come in, the boat would get further and would get further away until finally the boat drifted out of sight. And uh, the little boy was bothered by that and frustrated. He had spent so much time. This was the one masterpiece that he had created. And it drifted away. Well, a couple of weeks went by. A couple of months went by. He was in town with his parents and he went into a store and he saw amongst all the other things that was for sale, he saw his boat. It was in the little case there. Man, he couldn't wait to find the owner of the store and find out how he got his boat. So the owner of the store came over and the, he told the boy the story that somebody had found the boat and brought it in and he thought it was a good deal and a nice looking piece. So he purchased it and the boy told the man the story. He said, sir, you don't understand. I made that boat. I had an old piece of dirty wood and I carved it and sanded it and I made it with my own two hands and he said, I would like to have it back. The owner of the store said, boy, I'm sorry about that, and that's a wonderful story, but I paid for the boat, and if you want the boat, you're going to have to buy it yourself. So he ran back to his house and busted open his piggy bank and counted all that he had, and he didn't have enough, and he worked and he worked until finally he scrounged up enough, and he went back to that store and gave the man the money for the boat that he had found and the boat that he had purchased and the boat that he had created, and now he purchased it, and he brought it home in his arms and vowed, I will never let that boat out of my sight again. Now that's a silly illustration and a simple truth, but you realize that's what Jesus Christ did as a redeemer for you. As a redeemer, he bought back what he created. As a redeemer, he has been offered for all mankind. And if we embrace it, if we accept Jesus as our Savior, then the Bible says, in whom we have redemption. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I don't have any of this on the screen, but let me try to break the verse down and kind of give you a couple of things that are here. First of all, we look at the person of redemption. Notice the first two words, in whom. Okay, so who's the whom? Jesus Christ. How do we know that? It's not just because we sat in church and that's what the preacher said because verse 3 tells us. All right? You go all the way back to the beginning of this sentence. We are in Christ. And then Paul keeps repeating it. The beloved in the verse before is the same reference. In whom, in verse number 7, is the same reference. It's Jesus Christ, the one that has infinite life, who was able to purchase all any number of finite lives and still have enough grace, sufficient, and enough ability to save to the uttermost. There's the person. Second of all, there's the price. The Bible says in whom we have redemption through what? His blood. Jesus paid an astronomical, beyond comprehension price. His own blood. Whenever you refer to the title <coughs> Redeemer, the cross is placated before your eyes. I mean, there's, there's a level of compassion that wells up inside of your heart that causes you to remember. How does this uh, portray the work of Christ? What does Redeemer mean? Well, that's a long question with a long answer. And you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find the, the roots of redemption. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. In Job chapter 19, Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he will stand in that day. You go to the book of Exodus. You'll read about redemption when it comes to the ability with power. Only somebody with authority can redeem. You go to the book of Ruth and you'll find out that redemption carries with it a price and a purchase. And you have to be wealthy enough in order to redeem. Jesus did all of that. Because of my sinfulness, because of your sinfulness, you need a redeemer. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they, they threw the entire human race into sin. They lost their, the, uh, uh, their, their ability to rule over creation. They lost that intimate fellowship with God. They lost the reception of the inheritance that they once had. That was gone. 
So Jesus had to leave the throne of heaven, come down and enter human life, and live a perfect life, and then die. He had to suffer the agony of crucifixion, the heartbreak of rejection. Jesus had to go through betrayal. Jesus had to deal with the sting of ridicule. Jesus had to deal with the torment of God's wrath being placed on him, not because of what he did, but because of what we did. He was a redeemer. And anytime you think about how unfair you have it in this life and how rough life is for you, just remember Jesus went through all of it. We have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, we were redeemed not with corruptible things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In the New Testament, there's all kinds of different words that are used that help describe what redemption looks like. Let's turn to a couple. Can we do that? We'll just kind of hit the pause button on Ephesians for a moment. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Turn there if you would. Verse number 23. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 23. The Bible says, if I can get there, you're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. The word bought there is the idea of ransom. Here's the here's the idea of buying in the marketplace, purchasing a slave off the auction block. How many of you like to go to an auction? I don't really have a whole lot of those around here uh, in the country where where we were raised. It was kind of uh, it was kind of the thing that every third Friday that's what you did. You went to an auction. I think they still do that quite a bit. But uh, it, it's neat to go to the auction and to purchase something off the auction block. And that, that's that's the idea here. We are bought with a price. We were slaves with no ability to save ourselves. You were a slave to sin. The world wants you to think that they can free you from sin. But really, in fact, the world just cast us into more bondage. And Jesus came along as the Redeemer. He offered the winning bid, sold, and bought you. You're bought with a price. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go to the next one, Galatians chapter 3. Go back toward Ephesians, Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. <laughs> Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. All right, the first one has the idea of ransom. Galatians chapter 3 has the idea of removal. Bought with the intention to keep. Now, this is, this is powerful. If you don't get anything else, then get this when it comes to the word redemption. Because what that means is that when Jesus purchased you, he took you off the market. Why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. Because Satan in the world wants you to think that you can lose your salvation, that they can buy your soul or gain it back. But ladies and gentlemen, you are his and you belong to him forever. That's the eternal security that a believer has. And Satan wants to bid for your soul and claim your soul, but he can't have your soul because you've been bought and taken off the auction block. You belong to him. Now, Satan can try to ruin your body, and he'll try to tempt you to destroy you and try to get you to, uh, to dishonor God and displease God, but there's nothing Satan can do to put me back on the auction block and to buy me to himself because I've been bought and taken off, and I was put on that tree and cursed with the Savior, and he took my sin upon himself and redeemed me. Not going back there. Then there's a third one, 1 Peter chapter 1. Go there if you would, 1 Peter chapter 1. I just quoted this a moment ago. 
1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as gold and, uh, silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So this is a, uh, the picture of release. First there's a picture of ransom, then there's a picture of removal, and now there's a picture of release or being set free. It's the picture of one who buys a slave and then turns the slave free. Who does that? Well, that's what Jesus did. He set us free, not so you can live how you want to, but he set us free so that we were serve him. We're redeemed. We belong to him. Jesus was the only redeemer able. He's the only redeemer available. He was the only redeemer agreeable. And the list goes on. If you know Christ, you are no longer a slave to sin. You've been redeemed. 1876, <coughs> Philip P. Bliss, uh, Philip B. Bliss, sorry, excuse me, wrote a song that would be his last song before he died in a train wreck. He survived the initial wreck of the train accident, but then later died trying to save his wife. When they found Philip, uh, Philip's body, they found uh, several belongings, and inside of a coat pocket, they found the lyrics to the song, some, some bloody, some torn, and they pieced it together, a song that we know pretty well, and it may have been his last song, but it has been a lasting song. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse he set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed the pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. We sing that song sometimes. This is, this, is the, this is the emphasis that's given in this verse when the Bible speaks of the fact that you have redemption. All right, let's go back to the book of Ephesians. Let's go back to verse number seven. Not only is there a person found there and there's a price that's found there, but there's a pardon that's found there. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> and just... Just saying forgiveness makes you want to smile, doesn't it? Try, try it. it you, you'd like it. It's, it really feels pretty good. I mean, it just, it just kind of brings a smile to your face. You've been forgiven by the Lord. So what does that mean? What does forgiven mean? Well, the shortest sum of a definition that you can put on the word forgiven is to let go of an offense. There's a lot of doctrinal ways that you can define it with all kind of sentences. But the shortest way that I know to put words around it is to let go of an offense. When we clean out the shed or we clean out a room or we clean out a building, we a lot of times will put a whole bunch of junk in the truck or on the trailer and then we will haul it off to the, to the scrap yard or to the rubbish pit and we will take it and we will dump it and we will leave it there and it will get buried over and forgotten. I'm releasing it. I'm turning loose of it. That's what the Bible says that Jesus has done with your sin. The Lord lifts the burden of your sin, and he makes you clean. He has forgiven you. He bore the punishment so that you would know the peace of being set free. Now, now watch. Here's the problem. If you've been saved for a while, and you've been, you've been doing good to walk with God and to serve him, I think sometimes we forget what all that forgiveness really means. We almost become comfortable and callous to the fact of what all he forgave us of. I mean, he forgave you of the most wicked and vile sin. It doesn't matter whether you think your sin is better than someone else's sin. Your sin condemned you to hell. And he let go of that offense and set you free. And the Bible says it was according to the riches of his grace. It's something 
that we don't deserve. Years ago, there was a, at the Glasgow Mission in Scotland, a man who got saved and it transformed his life from a, a wicked lifestyle. And he was not a preacher, he was not an evangelist, and really was not a great soul winner, but he would take pictures that he would find that were colorful and spoke volumes and then he would match a verse to them and he would frame them and then he would give them over to people that would come into the mission in hopes that he could maybe kind of brighten their day or give them a word of comfort. One day he came across a magnificent picture of Niagara Falls. Man, he was just overwhelmed with the beauty of the picture, the power of the water rushing over the cliff, the unexhaust, inexhaustible amount of water that flowed down it. And, and he sat it on the, the side of his bed there, and for days and for weeks, he could never find a verse to go with that picture. Well, one day, D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey came to that mission, and they sang a song. Ira Sankey sang a song that immediately, as Mr. McCammon heard that song, he realized that's the song that goes with the picture. It's a song that we don't sing very much, but it described the endless rushing water pouring down over. The words of the song are this, Have you on the Lord believed? Still there's more to follow. Of his grace have you received? Still there's more to follow. Oh, the grace the Father shows, still there's more to follow. Freely he his grace bestows, but still there's more to follow. More and more and more and more, always more to follow. Oh, his matchless, boundless love, still there's more to follow. Describes the grace that God had. To wash away your sin. Imagine if God wasn't compassionate. What a horror it would be if God was not sympathetic toward you. What a tragedy it would be if God ran out of grace or mercy or forgiveness with your parents' generation. But it's inexhaustible. According to the riches of his grace, we have been redeemed. Paul is describing verse after verse, and it just gets deeper of everything you have because you've trusted Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize the depth of this promise that's here. And Father, would you take this reminder about our salvation and let it not just be a brush over of what we have received but may it really set into our hearts of all that you have given to us bless the few moments that remain in our service in christ's name amen take out your prayer list